Hi everybody, welcome back to the Blockworks Macro YouTube channel. This is Alf speaking. I'm at a friend's house, so please ignore my background, very colorful background. Today, my guest though is pretty special. I'm super happy to have here with us Michael Cow, which is a guy who has run a hedge fund for what, Michael, 20 years, something like that. Now he's running his own money and he's here to talk macro with us. Michael, how are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. I feel like I'm a fellow I feel like I'm a fellow Italian now after two weeks in Italy. <laughs> so you don't know guys, but he's wearing actually some typical shorts from Capri and uh, up until a week ago it was literally around like 10 kilometers from my hometown. I mean, this got to be right. interesting. Right. Loved it. <laughs> so my Michael, let's talk macro and uh, let's start from uh, our friends at the Fed. Because yesterday we had the Senate Banking Committee hearing from Powell. And I'm going to quote a couple of things the guy said. He goes like, you know, the economy is super strong. Uh, uh, consumers have a bunch of savings available and uh, we're going to hike. And actually 100 basis point hikes are not off the table. And we're going to sell mortgage-backed securities to the market. You ready, guys? So I just want to get your take on the Fed and how do you think the bond market will take um, this renewed hawkish stance by our friend Jay Powell? First of all, I'm, I'm, I tend to be contrarian by nature, not necessarily because I just want to disagree with the world, but because as you know, you know, when you, when you are, when you take a contrarian stance on something and you're right, the results tend to be the most asymmetric, right? And so about a year and a half ago, I would say that the contrarian stance that I had was that commodity price inflation, specifically originating from the oil market, would create a Fed that, that, would, that up until that point was only known to be a super, super dovish Fed. I said that the Fed would turn hawkish by, out of necessity and as a result, create a much stronger dollar and, and as a result, crash uh, risk what I call inflation capacitor assets, right? The bubbly assets, high duration uh, assets, crypto, et cetera. So that's kind of uh, been panning out. I am getting a little bit nervous now that the what used to be contrarian has now become somewhat consensus. Um, that said, I will say that I – to your point about the Fed, um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I, I, I wrote a thread summarizing one of uh, uh, Zoltan's pieces. I called, it, I called it the right of the Volkeries, or his piece was the right of the Volkeries. And one of the key points that he made that I agree with is that we are in a good is bad regime where, you know, I think yesterday when I think was it yesterday that Powell had the presser where he was being he was talking about, yeah, you know, households are in great shape. The banking system is in great shape, blah, blah, blah. I tweeted out a response saying, this makes me bearish because in a good is bad regime, this just means that the, econ the Fed perceives the economy and job market to be strong enough to absorb further tightening. And remember, QE, what caused this this big inflation, uh, unlike what QE did 20 years ago, was that 20 years ago, there was no monetary velocity. You had all this QE, but there was no uh, tinder to spark the flame. But this time around, we had massive, massive QE plus MMT. Uh, and, it, and not to mention, we had structural factors at play in the commodity markets that were essentially a decade in the making and then exacerbated by runaway ESG policies that met all of this QE plus MMT. So it was like a perfect storm to create this situation. But now that the genie is out of the bottle, the Fed can't, uh, can't un-MMT without uh, Congress, right? And with, a, with the prospect of an upcoming divided uh, uh, Congress, I don't see uh, them doing anything on the fiscal front necessarily. Uh, to restrictively. So QE essentially needs to, sorry, QT needs to now unwind the effects of both QE and MMT. And so to me, that means that the Fed will have to cut deeper, sorry, 
will have to cut into the economy, I should say, and hike for longer uh, and deeper than what most people think. And so, you know, I, I, whenever, like today is a perfect example where you're seeing uh, a classic sort of bad is good rally. And I think ultimately these rallies, uh, so far I've been right. So far, all of these rallies have been dead cat bounces and they've not, you know, we, I'm still waiting for like the big mother of all dead cat bounces, the, the one that's, you know, like a 20% counter trend type of rally, but none of these, have, that, that doesn't, that has not been happening. And so I say, look, beware the bad is good rally in a good is bad regime, because I think we are in a good is bad regime. I have to agree with the good is bad part of the statement. I'm going to even add that bad is probably bad for risk assets over here. So the interesting part is that most of the equity repricing so far has been a valuation driven equity repricing while earnings expectations, Michael, even stripping the energy component out of that hasn't really repriced down, anticipating the deeper cuts into the economic cycle that you were referring to before. So we're still waiting for that part, if you ask me, of the, of the equity repricing. And uh, when it comes to bond markets, uh, you know, bond yields coming down, which is spurring some sort of a, you know, relief rally in equities, you also there have to be careful extrapolating. I know that you have some views on the bond markets too. Shall we talk about that for a second? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I'm going to caveat this and say that, you know, I, first of all, I'm not a fixed income or a Fed mechanics specialist like some of your other guests. I've listened to some of your podcasts with, for instance, you know, Fed guy, you know, Joseph Wang, who's an expert here. So I don't profess to be an expert. But what I'll say is that my, my, contra my contrarian view in calling for a bearish steepener um, is predicated upon a couple of things. Number one, I'll observe that, you know, you probably listened to that uh, interview that Stan Druckenmiller gave, uh, you know, I think like two weeks ago or something like that. And he talked about something that I vehemently agree with, which is how the traditional signal from bonds um, it, it generally, the consensus view is that, you know, when, when, you know, the yield curve flattens or inverts, that's typically a recessionary signal. Um, but he said that, you know, the sig that traditional signal from bonds has now been obfuscated after essentially 15 years of sort of manipulation through QE. And I vehemently agree with that. That's, that's actually one of the, when I talked about bearish steepening first, uh, a couple of months ago, that was ac exactly the thought that I had had. I thought that, you know what, it's a, the, the, I don't trust the signals coming out of the yield curve. The yield curve has been artificially suppressed. We've had QE for, you know, essentially 15 years. And much of that was because we hit the zero interest rate bound um, uh, very early on. And basically the Fed, uh, uh, especially, uh, during the GFC had to get creative and figure out how to suppress yields further along the curve. And that's when they embarked on this massive, you know, uh, uh, asset purchase program. So, so the, the other point I want to make is that the, I, I'm, I'm also a fan of evaluating investment situations based upon not necessarily what uh, should be, the ideal or or uh, preferred outcome, but what what the what real world constraints are facing the Fed, right? So, in the case of what prompted uh, QE and all all these creative bazookas coming out during the uh, the COVID recession, um, the constraint was that you know what you're pushing on a string at the zero bound. So, there's not much more you can do with Fed funds rates. Fed fund Fed funds rates at zero, so you have to go suppress yields along the curve and and buy mortgage backed securities. Now the constraint is, um, I I think you know another thing that Stan said is that you know uh, there's he cited a statistic that there's really been no inflation above five percent that could be stopped without a Fed funds higher than that CPI. Once inflation gets above five percent. It's never come down unless uh, Fed funds have gotten above the CPI. Well, 
the the inflation print right now is running at around eight percent. Do you see Fed funds rates going to eight percent? I I'm hard pressed to even see Fed funds rates going past, well past three and a half to four percent without creating major funding stresses in the system. And you know to help quantify a little bit of what that might mean, um, I've been doing a little bit of uh, work and trying to figure out how much floating rate debt is out there. And I think as of Q1, I estimate that total amount of floating rate corporate debt is just under 3 trillion, maybe 2.7 trillion. We're talking about, you know, loans, revolvers, et cetera, out of 12.2 trillion of total corporate debt. The other interesting thing is that, you know, the size of the U.S. mortgage market is about 16 trillion. Approximately 17% of that is a adjustable rate. But of course, you know, most people in this last cycle have termed it out to, to uh, and, 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 you know, I have no idea and I don't know, you know, how to find the data on how much of that is actually floating. But even if we limit, and even if we say that that's zero, and we have two point seven trillion out there floating corporate rate debt, you know, there's there are some big concerns. Uh, oh, and then the third thing is that banks, right? Banks, the health of the banking system is predicated upon net interest margins, right? And so, if you have a a yield curve that essentially becomes flat or inverted, let's say. Um, between the rising, the unexpectedly and steeply rising interest expenses of floating rate corporate debt and uh, basically compressing net interest margins, you pretty much have a big f a credit crisis. Uh, you, you wind up engineering what's potentially a credit crisis. And, you know, in my interview with Jack Farley a couple, a couple of weeks ago, I compared the current uh, regime, um, a little bit more similar to the 2000 uh, internet bubble versus the 2008 financial crisis. And the big difference is that in 2000, that was kind of a, essentially a valuation bubble with tech stocks, right? 2000 and, 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 and equity volatility spiked as a result, right? But you didn't have as much credit vol. Um, 2008 was the opposite. 2008, the the eye of the storm was in the credit markets, and that's a much more pernicious beast, right? Because that can take down the entire fabric of the financial system with it. So, so, so the constraint that I see the Fed is facing is how to engineer a demand slowdown, a controlled demolition, if you will, of asset bubbles without creating a credit crisis. And so that's where I, the bear steepener comes in because just like QE was a creative solution to the constraint of ZERP, zero interest rate policy, I think QT through put in, 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 maybe in conjunction with the treasury could be enacted by well, first of all, the Fed could start selling its securities along the curve that it has on its balance sheet. But my understanding is that the Fed doesn't have super long dated maturities. But e even, the, even though a little bit there goes a long way because of the durations of the long end of the curve, right? Um, but I could, I could also foresee a situation where Fed and Treasury work together and say, hey, um, Let's let's concentrate more issuance at the long end. Why not even create a fifty-year bond, for instance? Right. I mean, if the ducks, if the ducks are quacking and willing to basically fund the U.S. government at three point four percent for thirty years, let's feed the ducks. Because to me, it's a heads you win, tails you win situation from the Fed's perspective and the Treasury's perspective. Heads, well, if the, if the bid is really there for that paper, well, then now we can term out ma our maturities, right? The, our, our U.S. government maturities, term them out. But if the bid isn't there and we actually wind up getting uh, bearish steepening, well, then that allows 
the Fed to be less aggressive on the front end and 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 have a better chance at a softer landing. Note that I said softer. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I think the Fed. I think the Fed's uh, tr- uh, track record of engineering soft landings is pretty pretty bad. But I feel like by by controlling the by having tightening along the curve as opposed to just jacking Fed funds to five six percent, which I don't know. I don't know how they could do that without creating turning this from a two thousand era valuation. Uh, uh, you know, uh, crisis to a 2008 era financial uh, credit crisis. Michael, so much good stuff. So let me try to see if I can unpack a bit of that for the audience. You are, I think, touching an open nerve of our monetary system works. I just published an article on the Macro Compass talking exactly about that, which is the time of tighter financial condition matters as much as how tight the financial conditions are. Sounds complicated, but it's not. The longer the financial conditions are tight, and it is difficult for us as private citizens, corporates, households, whatever, to refinance, the longer you do that, the more refinancing cycles you'll have to face at levels that are just unaffordable for levered up balance sheets at every light for decades, not decades, but for a decade, on financing levels which are very low. So people have termed out their loans, but if you make financial conditions tight for a year, for two years, for three years, that is a compounding effect because you were referring to to, um, floating mortgages or floating loans, right? And those are immediately impacted by that. But even the guys who have, the guys who have termed out and need to refinance to be able to hire an amount of people, to be able to run their operating margins and all of that, they will need to face refinancing cycles that are continuous. So the time, the period in which we tighten financial conditions is also important. That right now we have had tighter financial conditions, quite tighter than they were in the past for now what? Basically eight months already in a row. And if we hear Powell, it's not like if he wants to stop Michael. And now you're telling us, okay, maybe what these guys can do is they can make the yield curve steeper so that basically this effect is already prolonged, is passed through the yield curve all the way through all tenors, so that is a way to tighten financial conditions in a sustainable basis, rather than jacking up all the Fed funds rate to Taylor rule levels or whatever Powell yesterday mentioned. He went out and said, we want to bring rates to Taylor rule levels, where Powell, that, for Powell, that would be like, what, 5 6%, 7%, something like that. So the problem, the problem with that our, uh, sledgehammer approach is that, it, again, it, it, it metastasizes what is a certain cer- right now primarily in equity and crypto correction to potentially a major credit crisis which is not what we want yeah and i agree so now the problem is how do you steepen the yield curve because the yield curve obviously at the very long end bond yields once you don't you know you don't do qe anymore but in general bond yields at the long end tend to reflect long term economic growth long term inflation expectations but with supply demand you can sort of you know steer a bit here and there. And you said another very interesting thing. Yes, the Federal Reserve doesn't own a lot of 30-year bonds, but I've traded bonds for a while in quite some size. And I can tell you that 1 billion of a five-year bond is not the same of 1 billion of a 30-year bonds. <laughs> on, on, a, on a market maker or an investor balance sheet, you need to make room because a 30-year bond is much more volatile. It's going to absorb much more of your risk budget than a five-year bond will. Precisely. And therefore, even a, sm- a small amount of that is able to go a long way. So are we going to see a reverse operation twist? That is basically the question. Well, that's exactly it. Or, or, it. or I call it anti, anti-YCC, right? <laughs> Anti-YCC. Yeah. I mean, so we're saying the same exact thing. And, and you know, so I want to touch upon, I, th- I think you just made a very interesting observation about duration of tight conditions versus the magnitude of current tight conditions, right? Yeah, and 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 that's that's actually that's exactly the heart of my bear steepener thesis because if you think about what the yield curve represents, it is basically the risk free rate at all different tenors in time. Well, what's built okay. upon the risk free rate? You then have credit spreads all along with all along that tenor, right? And one would expect that with a steep yield curve you should also have a steep term structure in credit spreads. 
So there is also that compounding effect, right? And in a way, the I I I'm I'm just observing this kind of back of the envelope, but it seems to me based on how security prices are trading both both in terms of equities and like high, the underperformance of high duration assets in a way that's to me leading the fed it's basically saying that equity equity uh, risk premiums market equity risk premiums have already blown way out for for um, long duration assets, uh, uh, you know, any assets with very, very high terminal growth rates, those have underperformed the most. So you've already seen essentially credit spreads are in, uh, not, well, credit spreads, but also equity risk premiums at long tenors blow out relative to short tenors, right? And similarly, something that might be more observable might be the mortgage rate, right? We saw we saw headline uh, thirty year fixed go to about six percent recently, and you know I can't remember the the hyperbole headlines, but it was something like the one of the fastest uh, increases in that thirty year fixed rate. Well, yeah. I was looking at um, I made a couple of inquiries yesterday in preparation for our chat today to a couple of uh, you know people in the mortgage uh, business and. It's and the 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 gist I got is that the fifteen year fifteen year fix generically is around five and three eighths right now. Thirty year fix generically is around five and three quarters to six percent. So let's just call it five and seven eighths, right? Well, based on where the fifteen year risk free rate is and the thirty year risk free rate you're basically seeing that risky spread at the 30 year blow out to two and a half percent. Whereas the risky spread at the 15 year tenor is only about 2.2%. So you're kind of seeing the risky yield curve Mm -hmm. already uh, exhibiting some bearish steepening characteristics. You're just not seeing it in the risk free yield curve. And now, interestingly, we heard Powell yesterday want to compound this because let's explain why he went through with selling this mortgage-backed securities story. They announced quantitative tightening, Michael, and there are two ways to run it. The first is to let bonds mature from your balance sheet and not reinvest them. The more aggressive one is to attract sell these bonds from the balance sheet to investors. Now, mortgage-backed securities are a very weird animal. Um, their maturity depends on assumptions when it comes to prepayments. So the mortgages are repacked in a, in, a, in a security and people have options to prepay generally their mortgages. And how it works is that, you know, or refinance their mortgages as well and to extend the maturity of this of the securities. But if mortgage rates are at 6%, who's going to extend its mortgage right now? About nobody. And in the assumptions, when they calculated the prospective tenor maturity of these mortgage-backed securities, Yields were at three percent, four percent. So obviously, the Fed now is looking at a certain real maturity schedule, which is much looser than the one they would like to see. They'd like to see more bonds maturing from their balance sheet. In other words, the duration, the durations have lengthened. Correct, and they don't want that. They want to get rid of these assets. So the alternative they have is to just sell them outright to a market. But you just told me that the credit spread implied in these mortgages, basically. So the difference between mortgage rates and risk-free rates, effectively, is just widening out. And the longer the tenor, the longer this embedded credit spread is widening out. So who's going to buy those? Where is the appetite to buy these mortgage-backed securities that the Fed is going to sell? And how is the housing market going to handle all of this here? Yeah, I mean, look, I think I think at the, uh, you know, one of the, one one of the the biggest pushbacks to uh, my thesis is oh well you know the Fed will never do that the you know the, that's going to cause a recession that's going to cause a housing crisis that's going to cause housing prices to fall blah 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 I'm like wait my 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 retort to that generic count that generic argument is that I don't think you get it that's exactly what the the Fed wants the the Fed needs to engineer a recession just not a really really bad one. <laughs> right, because it, you know, if you think about what's happening, this all originated from 
you know, this, this uh, supply issue in oil, which in turn has transferred to all sorts of other commodities, which in turn is now um, uh, metastasizing into much stickier inflation like rents and wages, right? And so these things are not, these are, these are very, very hard to kind of undo without creating a recession. You can't, there's no surgical tool the Fed has. The Fed has a very, very blunt tool, which is just to like uh, curb demand and curb demand long enough until supply can rectify itself. And what I think maybe my perspective in analyzing oil and gas for the very closely for the last seven, eight years gives me is that I think this structural situation in oil is not so easily solvable overnight. It is not a transitory inflation. If you take a sledgehammer to the economy and, you know, in, in recent days, I've been like yesterday, last couple of days, oil's really taken a big drubbing. And, you know, even though I'm long-term bullish oil and I, I have a lot of my own balance sheet invested in oil and gas private equity. Um, I welcome this, uh, this sort of letting out of the air of the oil market because my view is that if, if oil continues this runaway path, um, it's going to cr- – this is another sort of good is bad situation. It's going to make the Fed – much hawker, much hawkish, much more hawkish for a longer period of time, cre- create um, the USD wrecking ball um, and make that go out of control and potentially precipitate another Asian contagion, right? You're seeing the Japanese yen fall to all-time lows. You're seeing the same thing happening to the Korean yuan. And of course, the big kahuna there is the Chinese yuan. I've been, I've been again, you know, maybe six or seven seven months ago, I made an out of consensus bet, or not not a financial bet, but a call, I guess, right? Saying that I think the the CNY at six point three is an artificial, uh, another spurious, artificially manipulated rate, and its natural freely floating rate, I think, could be north of seven or eight. Um, so, if, if that were to happen, right, that's gonna that could cause a much much deeper recession. That's not a garden, uh, you know, variety recession. And so that's that's so from the standpoint of letting some air out of oil and not let it go too high. I think that's ultimately a healthy thing for the oil market. But it also means that the Fed, it, we're probably going to have elevated inflation for quite some time and. Um, we just don't want the Fed to create a credit crisis in its efforts to try to combat it. Yeah, but the reality is that, I mean, people protested for a while, Michael, on the fact that, yeah, if the Fed hikes interest rates or makes financial conditions tighter, they can't print oil, they can't make ships from Shanghai flow more easily and bring, you know, chips to semiconductor chips to the West more easily. Yes, but what can they do at this point? They've been behind the curve for a while. They're now finally waking up. And if the cost to pay is a slowdown in the labor market, if it's a slowdown in the economy, their mandate at this point is, you know, it's normally uh, bifold. It's uh, maximum employment and price stability. And Powell has told us maximum employed. Yeah, well, guys, we're basically there. Uh, And yes, he's ignoring some stuff, but okay, we're, we're very tight. Price stability, we are nowhere close. <laughs> so the only thing he has is this ledge hammer, which is a non-precision tool, which is very blunt. But honestly, from his mandate and his perspective right now, he doesn't have a choice. And so he's just going to go for it. And your uh, your analysis on the credit and on and on the yield curve, actually, and on the housing market, um, is is pretty uh, pretty important here. Michael, what is the the last closing words you'd like to depart this interview from? Uh, with with our BlockWorks audience, what would you like them to know or remember from this interview? Um, I think I think that you know this. I guess I'll come back to something that you and I talked about before we started recording, which is I think that you know the I, because of structural issues 
in commodity markets. It will take more than a garden variety recession to actually change those structural issues. And so absent a complete, uh, you know, depression, which is, I mean, I'm not going to say that that's not possible because it, 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 it is easily possible if the Fed creates a credit crisis, right? But, but absent the, if we have a mild recession, I see a, I see a path out of this where, yes, you've had, you, you have asset prices correct in equities and crypto and housing, but it doesn't create an existential crisis for the banking system. That's what I mean by a relatively mild recession. If that's the case, we'll probably still have somewhat elevated inflation, but not 8% inflation. Maybe it goes back down to the 4 or 5% uh, type of inflation, and we're just going to have to live with it. I mean, that's essentially this stagflationary outcome that I, that's kind of my base case. Um, there are definitely some black swans out there, right? Because if we if we engineer a credit crisis out of this, um, then that is the scenario where um, you know it will break the back of oil. Because with with oil, one thing about oil is that you know everybody is a lot of the uh, the Uber bulls and oil that are calling for two hundred or two hundred and fifty. What I think they're not necessarily seeing is that. See, demand destruction, demand elasticity in oil is very inelastic in the short term, but longer term, it become it does, there is elasticity. And once patterns change and habits change, they tend to be sticky. And so, you know, for a while, um, before this Russia-Ukraine conflict started, I said that the Goldilocks uh, forward curve for oil was around 85 spot trailing down to maybe 65, three to four years out. That's a Goldilocks curve for oil producers. Very, very profitable regime without spot prices being high enough to create demand destruction. The last several weeks, we saw all this escalation talk about Russia, Ukraine, take spot to 120. But the the thing that I couldn't really get my arms around was why was it going to 120 when number one, you've got this everything inflation that's that will result in demand destruction for sure. It's not just inflation of oil, that's a cure for high prices. It's it's high prices in everything, right? That's a that's a cure for high prices. But then the second thing has to do with Russia. There's been no supply destruction out of Russia. There's just simply, there's all of the sanctions have been toothless thus far. Russian oil flows have not stopped. And so the thing to watch out for going forward, I think, is whether or not this will escalate to, escalate to the point of actual blockades of seaborne Russian routes. And this is critical because oil is the linchpin of everything. To me, Oil is the linchpin of what Fed policy is going to be. And if you want to know where oil is going, you need to see whether or not supply destruction is going to outweigh demand destruction. Right now, in the short term, even though I have a very long-term bullish thesis, in the short term, I see the demand destruction elements being much higher than the supply destruction element. There's been no supply destruction, right? But that that all changes if there are block if we escalate to, you know, blockade status and Russia is actually forced to shut in its production. But I suspect if we get to that point, we'll have bigger things to worry about because that's usually a casus belly for, you know, potentially World War 3. So that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Fair point. Michael, as I said as well in the piece of the Macro Compass today, get commodities right, get macro right at this Absolutely. point. Oil Absolutely. is basically, other commodities are basically 
dictating where the Fed reaction function will be. So get that right, get macro right. The thread, the thread that I would point to that I wrote about a year and a half ago was I, I called it the commodity price inflation butterfly. And that's, it's, that's proven to be true, right? The oil commodity butterfly has flapped its wings a year and a half ago, and here we are. And here we are today. Michael, thanks for the chat. I just want to make sure that the audience and the audience here can uh, find more of your work because you write some awesome threads nowadays on Twitter. So where can people find you? Where can they find you? Uh, just at Urban Cowboy, uh, cow with a K-A-O, of course. Uh, and that's, that's where I'm at. Thank yeah, you. Please go, guys, and follow Michael. Thanks for being here. Subscribe to the Macro Block Horse channel, guys. Don't forget. So if you want to hear Michael and I rumble about next time, you'll have the chance to do so. Thanks, Michael, and talk to you soon. Thank you.